Welcome to the Get Growing Tent for our uh, Gardeners Forum. Very exciting, most exciting event of the day. Seeding change in your garden. I'll hand over to Tamsin, your leaders in the forum. Good afternoon everybody and I know I speak on behalf of us all to say how just wonderful it is to actually be in front of people and not be talking to you on a Zoom screen. So um, this is all very exciting. Um, I'm going to first start by getting each one of our panel to introduce themselves. So I'm going to start with Hannah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I've been coming to Helen's Manor for about, just a, not quite as long as Terry. Terry's, Terry's been coming longer than me, so probably about 16, 17 years. I just love this place. I mean, if you've never been before, it's magical, isn't it? And I think they really have continued to pioneer the sort of green issues. And so my background is growing up on a small holding in Somerset, where we produced all our own food, so that seems very natural to me. And I've taken that into a career of garden landscape design, which is just an enormous privilege. And I have a new garden here, and it's brand new. Um, and it's just the other side of the cedar lawn, which is it's just a real honour to be able to work with the people here. John? Oh, me. Hello, everyone, including the lady from Dudley, by the way, there. Um, <laughs> my name's John Cunningham. Yeah, Dudley. Um, my name's John Cunningham. I'm a Scottish gardener. I, am, um, I live 11 miles away in Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire. And uh, I've been coming here for about eight or nine years as a punter. It's the first time I've been in front of a microphone. <laughs> and um, I, um, I do pruning generally for people who have individual clients, but also I've got involved in the show business. So I'm um, show business. <laughs> <laughs> in the garden show business. So I've done um, f 12, 15 Chelsea's, Hampton Courts, International Flower Festivals. Thanks very much. <laughs> and I've done lo lots of shows and show gardens in it, and I'm an RHS judge as well. Um, and I love coming here, not only because it's local, because it's really friendly. It's nice, and the music's good. Mm. Just listen to a band now, fiddling that, and it's awesome. So, yeah, bring it on. Lovely. And last, but definitely last, least, Terry Walton. I hope you've noticed they kept the two Celts apart. Because, uh, I mean, they got a translator at that end and a translator at this end, so you can hopefully understand us. But anyway, I mean, uh, I know nothing about gardening. I just have a radio garden, which you can't see. No, no one ever comes to, so it's a great, a great advantage to give the non-gardening attitude towards this. No, I mean, on my on my current allotments now. This is my sixth, coming into my seventh decade since I've been on the allotment. The same allotment site, not the same allotment. And it's always been my passion growing my own veg. It's always been my passion never to buy veg in a supermarket. Whenever I go along to our local Tesco's, I have to wear a balaclava because they wonder what I'm doing there. And if you walk down the fruit and veg aisle, you were asked by every punter to say, is this good enough, Terry, should I buy it? So I keep out of that. But I was very fortunate to be discovered in 2003 by the Jeremy Vine Show on Radio 2, which sort of changed my life totally from just being a, a non-entity in the Rhonda Valley to broadcasting quite regularly to six and a half million listeners. I presume a lot of you live in Hedyford and Worcester, so I do this regular Sunday afternoon spot with the, the two comedians of Radio Worcester, Jonathan Ray and Reg Moon, so I do that. And I'm, anybody who's not here tomorrow is listening to the radio, I'm on tomorrow afternoon. So if you want to join us for a bit of fun, we are there tomorrow afternoon. Every Thursday I do Radio Ronda. Every, uh, every other Sunday I do Radio Kent. And I do every fortnight on Radio Wales, we are hours question and answer. So radio keeps me busy. I get I'm fortunate enough to do quite a bit of television on particularly the Welsh Channel. I'm doing a very, very exciting project at the moment with some very well-known Welsh uh, chef on, on BBC. And we did a great filming session last Tuesday on the allotments, cooking with my vegetables. So life has been turned upside down for me. And it's great to come along. And as Tasman said earlier, I've really missed the last 15 months of face-to-face. -face. Zoom is not the answer. Yes, it's a way of communicating. But when you only see the face for a brief second, you answer the question, you can't see whether they're totally confused, whether they're happy with that, and you've actually met their needs. So it's great to be amongst you all, and I'll stop rabbiting at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm Tamsin West, I'm a writer, but I also run Stockton Gardens in Herefordshire, so it's a delight to be here. 
Now, we're going to start by telling you how COVID has affected us as gardeners because I think it's actually changed the way we garden, it's encouraged so many new gardeners. And then we've got some questions that have been sent in and then I'm sure we'll have time to answer questions from yourselves. So, I mean, Hannah, if I start with you, how has it affected the way you garden? Um, per personally, um, I don't think it's affected me that much personally, but what it has affected is the industry. I've never, ever known it so busy. So everybody I speak to, whether they're a gardener or a landscaper, all the landscapers I work with are booked up for at least two years. I don't think it's changed a lot for me personally, other than I did do um, a no-dig gardening course, that's what I did in lockdown, with the wonderful Charles Dowding, if, if, you, if you know his stuff. I met him, uh, I had the privilege of doing a, a feature at the Malvern Show, when it's on, called Eco Green and Growing, and I've gone down to meet Charles to, to learn about No Dig, to invite him to come and talk, and um, when I met him I thought, actually, I want to know what's in your head. So I, I spent a few months doing his course, his, his intensive No Dig garden course, and what it did for me personally is it actually debunked some of the things that I'd learned in my official horticultural training from years ago. Um, so my garden is completely no dig and I run um, a, a shared allotment up the road, which is also a no dig allotment with some friends. And that was the, for a while, that was the only place that Mike and, my, and, and I were going to, <laughs> to this allotment. We didn't go anywhere else, it was quite exciting. But what it's done in the industry is it's suddenly made us realise how important our gardens are. And I know so many people who have got into gardening that were not into it before. We've suddenly, well we've not suddenly, but we've woken up even more to the importance of green space and, um, and what our gardens can give us. I think, I yeah, think, but I think what Hannah's picked out, that she's been on a course, she's learnt... Um, so many people have learned and experienced things, but I think also we've also learned to throw the rule book out and go with what we think. So we've spent more time in our gardens experimenting and just going with our gut. So that's, I think, a really important thing that's happened to us. Yeah. John, how about you? Well, I feel, hello. I feel a bit slightly guilty here. One of the things I did when it started, this whole charade started, um, we, my wife and I, Janet, we're Janet and John, genuinely. <laughs> it's true, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding, Janet and John. One of the things I said, look, we can't go on holiday. Let's buy, I'm feeling a bit guilty here, a blow up spa. Yeah. <laughs> so we bought one, and um, look, it's awesome. It's fantastic. I know it's not helping the planet. Well, it is helping the planet. But I was, uh, when we first used it, I would have a bar, I would have a shower, then a spa then another shower. And I was using more water, so we've cut back on that now. But anyway, that's one of the things. But generally in gardening, personally, I've missed the shows because I was booked in for Chelsea and Hampton Court um, and Tatton Park, and I can't go. And I'm sort of gutted because I miss, I miss the deadlines. I really miss the deadlines. And when it first started, I was, I could do a lot of private gardens, people I've known for many years now. And um, one of them was in just outside Worcester. And I wasn't going to go, and the client said, why aren't you going? I said, well, COVID-19 and all that. She said, John, it's a two and a half acre garden. I could phone you and tell you that tea's ready outside and you can do that. And so I did what's technically called a risk assessment, and there was absolutely no risk at all. And when I drove from my house in the Forest of Dean to this place, 32 miles, 32 mile journey, I passed four cars. It was awesome. Yeah. It was like a film set. Awesome. I could not believe it. I loved it. But of course, it's now we're getting back to normal now, and that's the one thing I do regret is the traffic. Yeah. But I'm part of that. So, it's, so it hasn't changed too much for me, um, but everyone else is getting really good at gardening now. That's yeah. the thing. I would imagine, Terry, not much has changed for you on the allotment. Well, you know, as in, the allotment has never looked so good. I mean, I'm, over the last 365 days, I've only missed seven days. That one of them was Christmas Day, so she wouldn't let me work Christmas Day. <laughs> I promised I'd fetch some, fetch some fresh sprouts, but I wouldn't allow it to go. And I don't know if you all saw, but some weeks ago I had a nasty accident and I landed up in Morrison Hospital with plastic surgery. And that took me out for two days, but I was back on the third day. 
and we had three days away from the allotments at all. So in the last 365 days, I have missed seven days. And there's not a weed would dare put his head up now, because I walk up there, where'd he come from? And he's out. But the, what I do miss, for those who may have been there sometime, we have what we call Albie's Cafe on the allotments, which is where we have coffee and we all congregate. Well, we haven't been allowed to go in now. It's one, the guy, Albie, poor Albie, passed away a couple of years ago, and one of the deeds of that plot is whoever takes it on has to keep the coffee going. So Ron who's took it on, makes the coffee, we sit at a social distance outside the ca the cafe in Vinco Coffee, and we still have the banter from afar. But the real thing I've missed is during a year, I'm quite away quite a lot at various shows, at various talks, and meeting people. And I've really missed that. But as far as allotment's concerned, it has benefited significantly from the COVID. Well, at Stockton, we didn't open last year, and what I noticed was how much wildlife came into the garden, because I'm normally at the front collecting tickets and things, and it was just wonderful to be out in the garden, so watching who was visiting. But we, we definitely realised we missed people, and we needed you back, so we're very grateful that you're back this year. Now, some of the questions we've come in, have come in, so I'm going to go through them. And the first one, I don't know if anyone's doing this, but how should we maintain our lawns following no mow May? So I think I might ask John actually this question. Right. Okay, right. Is this on? One, okay. two, one, two. Yep, yep, it's on. It's not as loud. In my garden, I'm lucky enough to have quite a big garden, it's about three quarters of an acre, so I have an area of long grass, of wild flowers, and Look, if you're going to do this, it does look nice, but it sometimes looks a bit untidy. Personally, I would either cut a, cut a lawn through it, cut a, a, a grass path through it, or surround it with grass, because it can look really untidy. But it's like you're, when, you're, when you first got your horticulture, the first thing they say is, do the edges. Before you cut the grass, do the edges. Then cut the grass, then weed. And then you thanks very much for something. And, um, it makes a big difference. So if you're going to have a wildflower area, which I have quite a big one, and we can talk about the wildflowers that go in there, the you know, yellow rattle and stuff like that. I'm sure you're all gardeners, you must know, you know the score. It's not your first rodeo. Um, but I, we surround our wildflower area with a cut path, and it just looks neat and tidy. And um, I personally have started to introduce things like buddleias to attract butterflies, you know, and wildlife, and roses and just trying to make it a bit more, it's an exper outside, it's an experiment, you know. You're not a doctor in a garden, you're a vet. If the plant struggles, you can't, you can't ask it, you've got to try and work it out. So I've tried various things, roses work really well, uh, we try heleniums and lots of other plants like that. Crocosmia, nightmare, just goes, there it goes. So we, I experiment much more because I've got a private garden like everyone else and I do that, but long grass, Cut, a, cut an area around it or cut a path through it and then sit and enjoy it. Oxide daisies at the moment are singing. So Hannah, what would be your advice? Um, I think the thing is not to mow too much. And um, I, I almost think that on the whole, in, in, in the industry, in the design side of it and everything, we've really got to re-educate ourselves to, to not have the incredibly neat lawn, actually. And this is what I'm trying to talk clients into now and, and get them used to, is the idea that it's fantastic to have flowers in a lawn. Cut it occasionally, but don't cut it all the time. So not always necessarily a, a, a high meadow, but even a tapestry lawn, where you've got a lot of the clovers and the little suckling clovers and a lot of the wildflowers coming in, and just leave them. Because what you'll see is that is what the bees will go to. So many times that's where they'll be congregated. Um, and I was in, I unfortunately have to go to hospital occasionally for some treatment. I was in hospital and I was trying to find a green patch. The hospital I have to go to is, is in a very um, built up area and there is no green. But I, but I did find this little lawn and I counted six different types of wildflower there. And it just lifted my heart. And then the, the um, gardeners came along and <laughs> moved um, But it, that is where you'll find the bees. And even out here, look, the clover, the daisies. Um, I think we've got to re-educate how we think about gardens and how we look at them. And we've got to loosen up and not be as tidy. We have an area at Stockton, we have wildflower meadow. So once everything's gone to seed, 
we've started scything instead of strimming, I think, which is another thing to do. And it's so lovely. It sounds hard work, but actually if you've got a really sharp size and you get the action right, it's quite wonderful. You can hear the birds as you're working, and you don't get that sort of vibration for hours after from using a strimmer. Um, now, we know Terry doesn't have a weed on the plot, so I'm going to jump to the next question to you, Terry. Because you're, you're very organised, you're a productive plot, how do you attract wildlife to the garden? How do I attract wildlife? Well, I'm at the base of the plot, I took the current plot about now 25 years ago, and the first thing I did was make a pond. Because that attracted newts and frogs and the birds that they come along, so that was the first thing I put in. I also, around the plot, I have developed over the years, but I grow more flowers than I used to. You couldn't eat it at one time, I wouldn't grow it, because you took up precious ground. And a few years back, my wife planted in one of the top borders, some Lamanthazo, it's known as the poached eggplant, and that really attracts the bees. I mean, I, we were there one afternoon last week, one of the warm afternoons, and there was well over 150 bees buzzing around there. That is a bit selfish, really, because I only want them there so I can then shoo them off to go and do the broad beans, the runner beans, and everything else is on the plot. So that, that's another reason for doing that. But beyond that, I mean, I, I, I use no pesticides and nothing else which will harm any wildlife. And I, with, the, with the strawberries, for instance, which just starting to come online now, I net them because the blackbird's up earlier than me in the morning, eats more than I do. But I always throw a few outside the net for them to have their share as well. So I'm a great lover in wildlife. It's a great asset to any plot. It keeps, you want the predators to keep the pests at bay, so I'll have to keep them there as best I can. And Hannah, are you finding with your clients that it's more of a priority for them to, to try and attract wildlife? Um, yes, it is. It is, but it's also about them um, not wanting to be overly neat. I think that's the thing. Um, and, and I think um, if, you, if you see any of the sort of garden magazines and stuff like that, what's been pushed out for, for too long, in my opinion, is, is these incredibly neat outdoor rooms, you know, even plastic grass, dare I say it. Um, so I just, th I really think it's a re-education for all of us to, to, to re-look at how we, how we garden. There's, a, there's an amazing garden that's an RHS partner garden not far from here, at Nanty Beds, that I only went to recently, my son's favourite garden and he took me. And what Sue Mabley is doing up there is just fantastic and it's all about self-seeding and just having a handle on nature but letting it take the wheel and it's beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I think that's the way I'm going. <laughs> Excellent. We have beehives at Stockton Brew which is great fun because we also get honey but it's wonderful watching them, as Terry says, feet lining up to drink from the pond. So I think a pond um, is absolutely vital. Would you agree, John? Yeah, yeah. I, we've got uh, uh, quite a large pond, uh, but you've just reminded me that in a welfare area, we don't actually have water. Just now, so I've learned that I'm going to do that when I go home. We are good. If there's a big table here with a water feeder, that we're going to put water in there, that's good. So I haven't done that, but I have a large pond of which we had some fish and um, they all disappeared in a week they were gone didn't know what it was we have two cats Claude Badley and Lester and it wasn't them because there was no tails or anything lying around but we did see a snake we see a snake we reckon well not great not for the fish because they're gone so I don't know about this so we need to re but I'm not sure how long do you have any adder experts here any fish I would think it's a grass snake. No, no, it's not a grass snake. I don't think it was a. I don't know what it was. It wasn't a cobra or anything like that. <laughs> Forest of Dean. I'm, I'm, new, I'm new here. But anyway, um, yeah, we we will introduce water to more parts of the garden because um, it really does bring in. It does bring in the wildlife. I've got it in one part, but not another, and I promise I'm going to do that. We'll be checking up with you next. I'll send year. photographs on yeah, okay. this Evidence. social media thing that you've got. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, now. Um, a question here's come in. So I have clem a clematis that doesn't flower. Should I chuck it out? Now this is a really difficult one because I sometimes think we spend too long trying to get plants to grow that aren't going to like us. Take it out and put something else in. We have this sort of thing that we don't want to fail and we'll go through every possible thing before we make that decision. But, I mean, Terry, what do you think? If, if you had it, would you give up? Would you? What would you do? 
I'm very impatient as a gardener, in regard to my home garden, very patient on the allotments, but when I get home, when I grow the flowers, etc., if it doesn't, doesn't succeed in the first year, then it's for the chop and replace it. <laughs> Root off. <laughs> Hannah, what would your advice be? I think I'd try and feed it. I'd yeah. try and give it some phosphorus. Too compassionate, and, Anna. Yeah. Too compassionate. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would care for it a bit longer. I mean, we have no idea how long she's had it. It could be planted in the wrong place, that's the other thing. It could be in too much shade. Yeah. I mean, I um, think tomato feed is brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, just feed it. Look after it a bit. Okay, so and it might reward you. We're giving it a second chance. Give it a second chance. And the other yeah. thing that's brilliant and locally produced around here is alpaca poo. Ooh, Absolutely nice. brilliant for tomatoes and clematis. And it's produced by a lady called Lou's Poos in Shropshire. <laughs> Hopefully it's produced by her alpaca. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, one would hope. But I mean, honestly, it's brilliant. So, sorry, just my little plug. I discovered her last year and uh, yeah, I now have Lou's Poos for my tomatoes. Um, right, next question. Um, oh, John, this is good for you because you're the pruning king. What's the best time to prune my plum tree? Okay, plum trees. Uh, plum tree is a plum is a stone fruit. Yeah. So what you've got to remember with plums is, it's got to be in leaf. That's really important. There is a disease called silver leaf disease, which can I put this down a second and I can try and use my arms. Right. Okay. Silver leaf. It's a cool disease. What happens is there is your leaf. There is the top of your leaf. That's the waxy cuticle. The stuff on the top. What happens is this disease gets in through cuts. It comes in. It goes down the stem. And what it does is it just lifts. <laughs> it just lifts the surface. There's a gap appears, almost an air gap appears. And what will happen is, if you look at the leaf, it will look slightly silver. It's not silver. The green chlorophyll underneath is just separated by a thin layer. So all it does is it reduces the amount that the chlorophyll, which is a factory. I mean, a leaf is just a factory. It just reduces the amount that the chlorophyll can make you know, put goodness back into the plant and that reduces it. So don't prune it and when it, there's no leaves on it, make sure there's leaves. Personally, I do mine in about July, roughly around about July for all stone fruit. It's the same with all stone fruit, there's no difference. Okay, very good advice that was. Really? That was like a college lecture, wasn't it? <laughs> I was impressed with that. Um, now the next one I'm going to ask all of you, can you recommend a small tree for a garden? Now this is a regularly asked question. So Terry, what would be your first pick? And again, follow my theme, if you can't eat it, don't grow it, then I would, there are lots of small produced fruit trees now, which you can get many, two or three varieties. They are quite small, they've got very, very little space, pretty easy to look after, and you can grow them. So you get lots of pear trees, apple trees, which are designed even for a pot, grow them on a patio, make a small space, you get something back for your efforts, and it'll be give you uh, a lot of pleasure. Excellent, Hannah. Have you got a favourite? Yeah, I think the hawthorn trees are just beautiful. I love them. I love the bark. I love the fact they're very natural. All you need to do, and they'll grow in most soils. They're growing quite heavy clay as well. Is when you first put them in, just keep trimming the stem because they do want to go back to being a, a hedge. They have um, lovely nectar in the spring for the bees, and they have um, berries for the birds. So what's not to love about that? A small tree, lots of different colours in the in the flower as well. John, what's your top pick? My personal favourite is, is Amelanchia lamarckii, the snowy mescalus. It's a it's very common, very let's not say common because my name's John. It's very popular, and um, it's very easy to prune. It has lovely flowers in the spring, decent autumn colour. It's very easy to maintain. It doesn't grow too tall. I'm a lanky owner, it's my choice. Yeah, I'd I, I second that. I love that plant. And it also has edible fruit if you can get there before the blackbirds. It's oh, really? got everything, doesn't right. it? It has got everything. Go. But it's a very interesting question because when someone says small tree, do they mean six foot? Do they mean 15 foot? Because a lot of nurseries will label a small tree that can grow quite a substantial yeah, height. Yeah, and, and actually you've got this crossover, haven't you, between a small tree and a large shrub. Yeah. So you've got to think about the shape. If you want um, more of a multi-stem shape, you might actually just want a large shrub rather than a small tree. But the woods are oysters, so much to choose from. Well, look, this is, this is a, a fantastic time to be alive. I don't just mean today because you're here, but in the world, you know, what have the Victorians done for us? The amount of plants, the garden centres, 
the, the amount of choice we have. I, mean, I used to think we should just, I was taught in college, I went to the botanics in Edinburgh, and we were taught just native plants. And then you realise that we live in a globe. We live in a small place. And the amount of plants that we can grow is so good. I mean, it's phenomenal, the choice. Anywhere in the world, you get, if I look at my garden and walk around Australian plants, New Zealand plants, I mean, the bees don't know, providing you don't get something that's overproduced. It's a lot of these flowers you get now, they're, they're, they're amazing, but the bees just cannot get in. You just can't get in. So keep it simple and choose plants from all over the planet. That's, that's what I say. We were talking earlier actually about the trend for dwarf perennials. I don't know if you've noticed there's a lot and you think, oh this is great, we've got small gardens, we can fit them in, they sort of sell well, but they are designed to fit on a Dutch trolley so they're easy to transport. <laughs> so it's, it's a, you know, a, a, a cost thing, isn't it? So if you're a big producer, the dwarf plants are easier for you to transport. So this is why it's so vital that you buy from specialist smaller growers, because they are growing things as they should be and they're not growing mass produced. Yeah, I, um, I've got a second that. There's a, there's a fantastic book out called The Garden Jungle by Dave Goulson. It's been out for a few years now. And he's subtitled it. Gardening to Save the Planet. He should have just called it Gardening to Save the Planet. It's a superb book. And he commissioned, he, he works at um, Sussex University, and he commissioned one of his PhD students to look at bee-friendly plants bought in uh, just a normal garden centre as to how many, how many different types of pesticides and insecticides they had on them. And 72% of the plants that they looked at, just bought in a normal commercial commercial um, garden centre, were absolutely full of sprays. So the other thing I would say is yes, go to the go to the sort of, go to the organic little nurseries who know their stuff, who are not using peat, who are not using sprays. Because I was really shocked by that. So it's got a ticket on it saying be friendly. The bees won't go anywhere near it. They're much more <laughs> sensible. Um, and, and I just sort of think, yeah, we need to be aware of this, don't we? Yeah. Plants for trolleys. Yeah, because I, I judge new plant awards for the industry and I was quite shocked last year and the year before how many were dwarf, dwarf, dwarf. You think, oh my goodness, our gardens will all be right down here. Yeah. So I think we just need to be, be cautious with that. Um, now I've got a, a, an edible problem here, Terry. An edible problem. Um, now someone's um, contacted us to say their fig tree loses their figs year after year when they are big and healthy. What do you think is going on here? That's not unusual, that's not, not normal. I mean, what happens with fig trees early on, you will get some fruit drop if there's a lot of fruit on it. That's natural for fruit trees. You know it's going to need sustain so much fruit, so it drops naturally. If they're big and ready, I suggest that person is leaving them too long. They actually get into the overripe situation. The plant is now shredding them before it wants to. So they're not picking them quick enough, in my opinion. They are just becoming finished and drop it before they're there, so pick them much sooner. And again, you can, you can ripen them fairly well off trees, so it's not a major problem. That's easy, pick yeah. early. Right. Um, we pick ours quite early at Stockton Brew and we place them you know, in the sunshine, just so that they don't get bruised and battered and you know, they, they ripen beautifully. Now, and last question from the outside world, though we're gonna bring the questions to you. Um, what's the best gardening book for beginners? Now, Terry, what would you, other than the wonderful books you've written, for, <laughs> uh, is there a book that you, you favour? I, I learned a lot. There's a, there's a writer called Andy Cleavy, who uh, is a great allotment gardener, a great guy who writes, and he, he wrote the allotment book. It's just called the allotment book. And in the second of the allotment album, and which I wrote, this book would come second if we want a bit more knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, have you got a favourite book? Do, do you know, I can't think of one, but I think I've probably learnt from other people. I think it's just such a hands-on thing, isn't it? If, if you've got somebody you can follow, particularly if their garden is near your garden, it could be the same climate and the same sort of soil. I think I would try and learn off another person rather than a book. Okay, sounds sensible. John? Intimate. <laughs> Look, the internet is absolutely fantastic. It is absolutely brilliant. I, I never really got involved in it. I, I joined something called, um, on Facebook it was called 
Gardner's Question Time, friends. Now, sa sadly, I haven't ever, well, for about 15 years, listened to Gardner's Question Time. But I thought I'd join this because I recognise the words. I joined it and then I watched and people were putting questions up and it was cool. But I wasn't really in there. And then what happened was there was a lady that was not very well. Her name is Sandra and she was a Polish lady, Sandra something, I can't remember, from Leeds. And I didn't know that, but I, you can look them up, you can find out stuff. Anyway, so she said, could you please send pictures of where you're working today? I just happened to be at Chelsea. So I put a little picture up and I put view from my office today. And she loved it, she said, John, that's fantastic. And then another 350 people said, this is fantastic. So I did it every day. And they watched the whole garden getting built up. It was Mark Gregory's one. It was, um, it was a, supposed to be a Yorkshire garden. It was beautiful, oh, gold yeah. bestie show and all that. Anyway, so she loved it. And I had to do that for every show I went to for the next three years. I did it every, and I had hundreds of people liking it. And I didn't even know these people. It was fantastic. And if you had a problem, you just put your question in, put a picture of the bug or the, or the leaf, and people would write back. Yeah. It's such a... It's such a brilliant thing, the internet, if, if it's used properly. And there's so many people like you yeah. love gardening, love horticulture. It's the most popular. Why there's only like two television programmes about gardening on TV, I can't understand. There's more programmes about murder than there is about gardening. And yet, oh, I like the way he says that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, than there is about gardening, which is Britain's most popular yeah. hobby. You know, I find it a bit bizarre. So I use internet a lot. I, I like the idea of creating your own diary because I think you can learn from yourself and um, I, I love looking back in my diary and seeing I now know that we're exactly two weeks and three days behind last year because it says in my diary I now remember that I shouldn't have used that feed because it was no good because it's in my diary. I think we need to learn from ourselves and make note of what insects and birds visited and um, did you not see them this year? You know, have you heard the cuckoo yet? Oh crikey, what's going on? You know, I just think that keeping diaries is a really, really good way because it's your garden you're focusing on. So really, you, no one knows it better than you. So um, there are some amazing books out there and if you're a reader, great but then like john says there's other ways of getting your information can i just come back a moment yeah one of the lucky things i had i took my first allotment at the age of 11 and the average age of the other plot holders in those days was over 60. and for six months they watched me and thought this lad won't last <laughs> <laughs> and then after i'd been there six months i gained their respect yeah. and i had an 11 year old brain which was like a sponge yeah. and within four years they'd give me thousands of years of experience and a lot of knowledge. So I learned that was the best learning is from someone who's done it. Because they're in the environment, they're in the area where you're growing, they know all the tricks of the soil, so you'll learn a lot from your, your neighbours, you do from books written countrywide or worldwide. Yeah. I, I think Terry's got a point. If you find a book by someone like Terry, who is actually physically doing what they're writing about, that's going to be really useful to you. Um, so yeah, um, I think there's lots of options. Now we've run out of questions from the outside world. Yeah, Has anyone chance. got a question? They oh, yeah. at the oh, right at the ready. back. You can sit there very patient, waiting. <laughs> um, you'll need to shout. <laughs> yeah. I've got real problem with ants in the garden. The patches in the lawn, and one of my rows is in a pot, which looking pretty miserable. And I took it out, and it was like a complete ants nest in the, in the actual pot. So. What can I do organically to get rid of ants? Ants eat cherry. Cherry. Oh, bloody. I got the, I got the nasty point yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> We're number one. I mean, ants are not a real garden pest as such. They're, what they do is they, they love dry areas, they build their nests, and they undermine the roots of many plants. And it's usually a symbol that it's very, very dry. The only time ants become a pest to a, a vegetable grower is when they start farming aphids. You know, they, they live with aphids to take the honeydew and protect them. The, the only way you, I know, and it's a rather painful method, and it actually kills anything around it, is to pour hot water over them. And that, but, you know, it's rather dramatic. I mean, they, they, you've probably got areas which are too dry, too sandy, and that's their perfect place to live. I've got one part of the 
Down. You don't see an ant there, do you? Don't know, I'd yeah, say no, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, and that's the problem. They yeah. love the, the dry, sandy soil because they can nest so much easier. They can make, they can move it around. When it's clay, they have to work too hard. They move on. <laughs> but there are on, there are all these nasty yeah. things you can buy at garden centres to put down, which they take back their nests and kill them. But to me, it's live and let live with an ant. I, I have no I'm a problem with ants being in my garden. And I, all I try to do is make it uncomfortable and drive them away. <laughs> they hit the back and no, just, just following on from the ant que question, um, and something that's very uh, simple and uh, non-toxic, cinnamon. You, oh. you actually sprinkle cinnamon on them, they go. Oh, if you didn't hear that, cinnamon, sprinkling cinnamon on the ants. It tastes lovely. Oh, oh, see, there we are. We've got the answer from amongst you. Which is so it's always there, isn't it? The knowledge the is there somewhere. You look there. every day in gardens and school day. Excellent. But right, anyone else got a question? Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Can I have a supplementary to John, please? And it's about I've got four gauge. They're most supposed to be um, dwarf varieties, right. but they're now about 18 feet up <laughs> with a leader. Yeah, they're, they're very high, and I get very little fruit. So, can I cut them down at all, or will you can. I? Yeah, no, you can. A gauge, you say? Yeah, gauge, yeah, green gauge. gauge yeah. Green gauge. Yeah, I would do it again. It's a summer prune. I do my, I do, I don't prune apples in the winter in my garden. I just prune them in the summer, which is very little pruning. And it's the same time I would do gauges in another where we now June in another month. Go and take that leader. I would take about a fifth. How, how, I mean, how wide is the tree compared to this tent? That way. Yeah, it's about uh, the size between the two ladies up front. Right, okay, yeah. Well, look, no problem. Find the leader, take the leader back by at least a third. Keep the shape of the tree. Where do you live? Ludlow. That's too far from me. I would have came along. I would have done. On the way back, the gardeners are like that. We do that. We just turn up and do that. Um, that. I would do that. I would thin it out. Just literally thin it. It sounds, is it very crowded as a plant? So there's lots of. Uh, no, I have thinned it, but I, di I didn't dare touch touch it about the height. I was worried that I would Don't destroy be, them. This is how plants work. This is basically the tip of a plant, the apically dominant thing, the bit at the top. Basically, there's a drug dealer up there. <laughs> it's true, no, it's true. It produces, uh, I think it's gibberellic acid. There's a, there's a drug up there. And what it does is it feeds all the side shoots. So they all sit there chilling, and that, which is why it doesn't... The minute you see someone cut the main shoot, the drug dealer's gone, everybody weakens up, and then you get all the shoots come up. Water shoots is the same thing. You cut it, you take out the drug, and then they all start growing away. So by doing it, but the thing is, by doing it in the summer, they're all awake, they're doing their stuff, you don't get the surge. A lot of people, when they prune fruit generally, you know, apples in the winter, they have a, I'll explain it like this, 100% of roots underground, not touched, 100% on the top, untouched, normal tree. You cut a third off, you go in and you do all your pruning, your spark pruning, you take it all back. You've reduced the top by 20%. Come the spring, when the factory's all open, up, up it comes 100% of the root come up and feed 80% of the plant, which is why you get the surge and growth. By doing it in the summer, for stone fruit you should do it in the summer anyway, but by doing apples and pears and all that in the summer, you reduce the surge and it's much easier to maintain. So I would thin it more, don't be afraid to take that, that shoot down, and you'll, it should be fine. Don't Thank let it get you. too tall, you can't reach them. <laughs> Excellent. Question, yes. Oh, hi. Um, I've got an awful lot of aphids on my fruit trees, and the leaves curl up, and I, I'm without lost. Using without using soon. something nasty, which I'm not doing, I don't know what to... How big are the trees? They're quite new, really. How many are there? Trees. Yeah, you said they're not. Oh, no, no, I've probably got about 10 fruit trees in the garden, I expect. You know, cherries and plums, they all seem to, uh, my damson tree, they all seem to, you know, I spray with um, neem oil, I've sprayed with neem oil, yeah. which kills the ones in the touches, but then two days later, because they're all curled they're over, all curled up. you know, they're so, Do you know that, as you've got to take your hats off to, um, 
to insects, you know, we have the leaf cutter yeah. um, and all that where they, they cut, and they make it curl in. Yeah. So they've yeah. got a, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's like you a Trojan horse. It. Yeah. Uh, look, it's extremely yeah. difficult. Encourage wildlife. Get birds to come in and eat them. Put feeders on yeah, the trees yeah. and then pick out all the stuff that falls on the ground if the pheasants don't do it. Yeah. I would use my, I use soft soap on mine yeah. where I can. I get them early and use soft yeah. soap. Other than that, um, pick them off. It's so difficult. I know it's yeah. not. It's yeah. Ten trees is a lot. Yeah, I would, I would keep them down. Yeah. I would keep them down, yeah. and I would put water, and I would encourage wildlife in there. And yeah, it's ladybirds, isn't it? That yeah, because yeah. they are phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so maybe some ladybird habitat. Yeah. Yeah. Just really looking for that, so you can seriously encourage them to come in. Yeah. And eat your aphids. And accept some. I mean, this is as Terry was saying about throwing some stuff strawberries out. Accept some. That's, that's why we're in the. That's why we're in the state we're in at the moment. Farmers don't want to. You know, everything's not all farmers, but um, when they, they, they take a crop and nothing lives in it, they've got to it, and it's just so give a little back to nature, yeah. and um, they won't be as they, they shouldn't be as selfish as they are. So, I'd put well, get more well later. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, any other questions? Oh, there must be one. No. Don't be shy. I've got one. Yes. Um, I've got a stock plant. I've got a stock in my garden. And the leaves of um, some of the lower leaves have turned yellow. It's kind of black spots. Yeah. Stock? Stock. Though. That's the highly yeah. scented. Yes, that's right. right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's yeah. just a leg and yes. then it's yeah. on the top. The lower leaves have gone kind of, it will seem a bit yellow and kind of black. Marks. When does this happen? Um, last few weeks. Look, without seeing it, it's very difficult to see. Um, a lot of people, evergreen tree, evergreen, I'm just going to go as an example, evergreen plants, what happens is, at the moment, we've got a lot of stuff lying around the garden, and it's because evergreen plants tend to drop the leaves. They've got to drop them sometime because they're, they're evergreen, so they're, and they drop them at specific times a year. If it's just the old leaves, I would pick them off. If it's only new leaves, that's when you want to panic them. But they, they have to they has they have to get rid of the leaves sometime. So if it's only the bottom ones, I wouldn't panic. I've, I've seen it on lot I've seen it on hellebores and it's not a it's not a disease, it wasn't a black spot disease. But they have to get tired sometime and get rid of these things. It's like going for a haircut and you just just cut them off and keep an eye on it. Lovely plant by the way. Is there a perennial that you your go to perennial when you're creating gardens for people that want wildlife? Yeah, I, I, I think there is. There's a few probably. But Verbena banariensis. And I just, I wouldn't go for any of the other verbenas because it's tall, it has this lovely um, sort of square stem so it doesn't need any staking. It gets covered in butterflies and it flowers its late nectar for the bees and I just love it in any combination. I have to, I've now got a clay soil so I have to add quite a lot of grit to get it going but it grows best actually just in gravel, doesn't it? I love it, I absolutely love it. I tried, was it Verbena Bampton, and I lost it, so that was a shame. I think we've got to start trying things and experimenting. A question I'm always asked, is it hardy? But we, our gardens and the climate is changing so dramatically, it's, it's quite hard to say whether things are. We're getting a very dry summer and an incredibly wet winter. So I'm just wondering from Terry's point of view, on the veg growing front, how the climate change has affected your growing patterns? Tremendously. I mean, if you're a gardener for a long standing, I mean, we used to have the typical seasons. You could guarantee in spring, around about March, it would start to warm up. You could start to plant in the greenhouse, you could start to plant out, and then you would have a reasonable summer. Come mid to late September, along would come, the, you could guarantee a frost by the end of September, which will put pay to all your summer plants and then put your flavour into all your winter plants. Your swede, your parsley, your leeks will all get the benefit. You could then start preparing your soil during the winter ready for the following spring. So it was definitely clear. What I have to do now, and I only learnt this practice about 10 years ago, I cannot no longer turn over ground and leave it bare in the winter because every nutrient would now be washed out. It is so mild, it is so wet, so anything at, by the end, mid to end of September, anything that's got nothing growing for the winter in it is covered with green manure. And that then gives it a blanket of protection until at least the end of January. What green, on, what green manure do you use then? I use a mixture of uh, vetches yes. and rye. Where's the old rye, uh, rye and vetch? The 
Worst of all, rye makes a fantastic root structure, hangs on to all the nutrients, makes the green grass. What you effectively done is made the horse redundant. You dig that green cut, <laughs> green in, the horse hunger digested, you dug it in. The vetches make the nitrogen, put the nitrogen back in. So when you turn it back in, you've got a great balance of nutrients. You've hung on to the nutrients you've got, you've increased them, you turn it in the end of January, six weeks later you're planting, then you're releasing those nutrients, you've protected everything, and again, that, the other things which you never would dream of doing. I used to love turning ground over, leaving exposed to the frost and the elements mm. during all of November, December, January, broke down to a fine tilt in January. There is more rain in October now than January and falls at any time of the year. Goodness me, it's all, it's all changed. Um, we've probably got one time for one more question if anyone's got one. I have a question. Whoa. Oh, yes. Um, I've got a, a daphne and two thirds of it looks wonderful. Um, it's all flowered, but there's one third of it that looks really quite sad. And it, normally I would just cut it out, but that would make it a really strange looking plant. It's still alive. And I don't understand what what do you think? Yeah, has it happened recently? Yeah. Um, it's happened the last two years. Oh, so it's happened two years running. Yeah, and it's the, the rest of it is perfect. And you, and you can't see any sort of disease on it? No, oh, I was going to say cross. So is it an evergreen? Yeah. Is it, is, which one is it? Odorata or Marginator? Yeah. One of them. Yeah. Um, do you know, I've, I've had that happen as well, and it's where a whole stem has died off. I get the same problem sometimes with acers, mm. where it's a beautiful tree and then oh, dead. Just one. I think you I think you'll have to clean it. Like Take cuttings, try cuttings though. It does it's not yeah. easy to root, but it will, but it, it will, will root. yeah. But um I've had die back on on one of ours and I just pruned it off and that's all you can do. I don't think it will come back. Sorry. I think the other thing is we've got to realise trees and plants get stressed. You know, we we've had an incredibly dry, cold April, didn't we? I mean it was just weird. And then an incredibly wet, cold May. And we don't necessarily see that in the trees and the plants straight away, but we can see it a season later, can't we? That, that you know, there'll be an early leaf drop or something. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, because we've all been through an incredible amount of stress, and it's not till now that people are starting to show how this awful thing we've been through has affected them. It's no different to our plants and garden, you know, and trees, is it, really? Yeah. It's true, it's very common. And if I'll tell you what's just popped into my head now, and I don't know why I'm telling you about it. Oh, yeah, horse manure. Horse manure. In the 1890s, in New York, there were like a million horses. There was a, there was, because everybody went around by horse, you would, you, that was the way to transport goods, it was the way to transport people, um, the, the, any canals, anything like that, they would be horse drawn. They had so much manure that, like the cars of today, it was a serious problem. The smell, diseases, it was an absolute nightmare. So it's interesting that you'd think manure, I'll have it, bring it here. But when you've got a million horses <laughs> dropping 28 pounds of <laughs> packages every day, each horse. I don't know why I brought it up, but you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just interesting, that John, was all I thought I'd share. That sounds like heaven to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining you. us. It's a real delight to see you all. I hope you have a lovely afternoon here. It's just heavenly, isn't it, to yeah. be out. Yeah, um, so thank you from all the panel here. Um, I'm going to be over by the door there selling my book, Modern Country Diary um, Garden, which is a, a diary of my life. Bit of a plug there. Terrible shape. I'm going to be buying plants at the, from local growers, by the yes. way. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm going to go there now. And don't forget to go and see Hannah's garden. Yes. Yeah, do go and see my garden. It's, we've just started it. We, we, we built it in um, April. We've just planted it. So it's probably about halfway through. It's based on the Fibonacci sequence or the Fibonacci spiral, which is how we understand that plants and nature grows. It's that lovely curve. It's a mathematical sequence with a curve. So it's about healing. And, and when the garden is finished, it will be a, a garden that hugs you in with scent. That's the idea. Sounds heavenly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Right, let's go. You're gone.